Okay, welcome to the very third episode of Live Work Anywhere. <laughs> very third. <laughs> and here we have Nathaniel Boyle, who is the founder of the Daily Travel Podcast, dailytravelpodcast.com. Uh, maybe the, probably the only travel podcast that's daily in the entire world. Um, and it happens to be the number one podcast on iTunes. Um, Nathaniel is a jack of all trades. He's a web designer, freelancer, and he's also an entrepreneur. And Nathaniel wanted to travel uh, from as long as he could remember from traveling young. So I'm going to ask him to tell us about that. But, every, but welcome, Nathaniel, and thank you so much for being part of this uh, third episode. Libby, thank you. It's cool to be here. Actually, it's an honor to be here. <laughs> it's an honor to have you. Yeah, all right. So tell us about uh, tell us about this. I, you you wanted to start off traveling young. Oh yeah. So when I was you know five or six, my mother uh, pulled off this this home swap that basically she rented our house in Massachusetts, which was a house for you know I think a one two three four four bedroom house for an entire castle in the Lake District of England. All right. And so I was five. I actually turned six in this castle. And to me, that, that, that is, this was like a, a pivotal moment. Not at the, I didn't know it at the time. I had absolutely no idea. I was five years old. What do I, what do I, a little kid running around the north of England, right? But what, what happened was that I, I went, and I went to this amazing place, and they had, it had suits of armor and uh, acres, hundred like, like well, maybe not hundred, but dozens of acres of, um, of sprawling green fields, uh, it, it was an unbelievable castle. It was a castle that we stayed in. It had a sculpture and a round driveway that went on for like two miles. Wow. So for this little kid turning six, it was it was a really impressionable time in my life to be somewhere that was so fascinating and really imaginative. And so to me, really early on, I felt like travel, I started to kind of relate travel to imagination and to an ability to, to cultivate imagination at a young age. And so because, and it's not, it's not that I was thinking this when I was there at age five or six, of course, it was because later on I would look back and still to this day, there's this castle somewhere in the North of England, right. That I would love to get back to, mm -hmm. but I, I can't describe it very well. I just have these memories of being there I, and I've had this experience and it, it, it's this like, I'd like to get back there. I want to get back there. And it's out there somewhere. And so I'm constantly chasing not just that castle, but this opportunity, that feeling, the feeling that I have that of the disconnect, the space between me and that castle, the space between my experience, my memory of that place. And so I have this kind of, I don't know, maybe oversensitivity to imagination as it relates to travel and our ability to become more creative people through our travels. Uh, because when you travel, you look at things with that kind of childlike sense of, of wonder or awe all over again. You can look at new foreign things. You surround yourself with stuff that's brand new and you say, oh my God, what is this stuff? And you become kind of an open receptor to new experience. And then you process it and you create memories because you, you're paying more attention to it. And so for, me, so for me, real quick, just to tie that thought up, it just comes down to uh, putting yourself in a position to be more creative, to be more imaginative. And that's my relationship to travel, which started very, very early on. Yeah, that's fantastic. so. You started. You, so you were five or six years old, which is fascinating because it is exactly when you know you're you're very imaginative, you're very creative, and um, that you you told me earlier that played a part in your career. So as you were, you had this amazing experience, which really sounds amazing at five years old, turning six, and what happened in terms of school, career, your career path as a result? Uh, well, you know, I would have to say that traveling, getting started traveling early. There are two types of people when it comes to travelers, so two types of travelers. The first is the one that gets started traveling early, and the second that doesn't, that doesn't do it until later in their life, right? So uh, either, either case, if you start traveling early, I think you're constantly, and, and, and it hooks you and you're interested in it, you're constantly trying to get back to that childlike appreciation for the world. You're trying to get back to this heightened sense of wonder that you experience when you're traveling because you're surrounding yourself with all this new amazing stuff. If you get started later in life, you hear a lot of people who get started later in life say, oh, I feel more alive or I feel, I feel, you know, like these precious few moments that I spend traveling, I feel more alive in those moments than I do in the vast majority of time spent living at home in my day-to-day -day routine. And it's like, why is that? I don't know, but I want to keep traveling because it feels good. 
Why is that? Well, it's because you're because we're basically stepping into the unknown. We're stepping into uncertainty, and we're uh, our bodies are like programmed to reward ourselves with dopamine. So we get this this like great feeling of doing stuff that challenges us, that that's new to us, that's exciting to us. And so for people that get started late, all of a sudden they get this taste and they're like, oh, I have to keep doing it. I have to now, now I need to fold travel into my life more often. But people who, who kind of grew up with it early on, I think maybe they tie it more towards playfulness, childhood, imagination, getting back to a state of actually enjoying life in a way like, you, you know, you're, tr- you're tromping through your backyard like Calvin and Hobbes. And you want to get back to that world and not so much um, – the 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 the, routine, the 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 drudgery or the dull ache of routine right so we, so for you you were trying to get back to sort of this uh calvin and hobbes play like <laughs> and so and so what did that do for your career you mentioned you were in a startup that focused on travel or... so i let's see that's a good question so i was i was raised by a painter and an entrepreneur those are my parents and so i've kind of never had that model my parents never gave me that nine to five model that routine atomic family thing and they're divorced so that's even more uh fragmented i've always had to kind of define what family life meant what being a kid meant what a date what a desk job would be or what a career would be and i kind of even nowadays reject the concept of the idea of a career and i'm almost pursuing like an anti-career because it's a more creative path for me we don't have to get into that i'm <laughs> i'm a spouse thing. i'm like off on a tangent um <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so for me, I went to school and studied philosophy at college and no, I'm sorry, philosophy was my minor filmmaking was my major. And I studied some business courses as well because I was interested in a lot of different things, but filmmaking was a way to tell stories. And I still always had this desire to travel, study abroad, um, take up, take trips whenever I could, uh, as a student. And, um, and I did some, but not enough. And so it started eating at me. And then when I got out of school, I said, well, I don't know, do I want to take my filmmaking degree and move to LA or New York? And I thought about it and I had lived in in LA for six months and I didn't love it. And I, and I think that I love the medium of filmmaking and I love storytelling and I love the feeling associated with storytelling. I love cinema. I think cinema is the ultimate art form. It's the perfect, it's like this synthesis of vision and music and sound and all this stuff tied together. It's the highest form of art. I really believe that. But I don't, uh, I didn't want to get into the industry because I just didn't love it. Um, so I was kind of like, how do I, what do I do for a career? So I took a job at a startup in Boston, which was basically a healthcare staffing firm. And they were, we were bringing uh, PTs and nurses over from the Philippines and India to work in the United States because with the baby boomer generation retiring, getting older in the nursing schools in the U S not out, not putting out enough, uh, nurses and basically to fill the workforce we needed to fill it some way so i I took a job with this kind of a company and the idea was that i would be able to go and i would be able to travel to the philippines to work with our outsource team right or i'd be able to travel to india and um, meet the people that were training the nurses that we were bringing over and i was basically like a cultural liaison to these people all that amounted to was meeting them at the airport in boston and it never (laughs) amounted to any more travel than that no no Um, so at the time I was dating my girlfriend or who's now my wife and she was living in New Zealand for six, seven months. And so to, to have this dangled in front of me, to never dangle travel in front of anybody's face because it just makes them go nuts to have that done. Plus to have a relationship, a long distance relationship with somebody that's in a place doing the things, all the things that I want to do. It really kind of pushed me over the edge. And at that point I quit that once, the, once I saw the first, inkling that that company was going to fail. I quit my job and uh, decided to take a, a round the world trip. I think that's great because uh, I, I did something similar. And I think a lot of us do that. We say, okay, we want, we're interested in travel, but what kind of job is going to take me over there? And it's interesting that you said dangle. So did they, was, what kind of promises were made? Did they say, you're going to be, like you said, our liaison, you're going to go over? They did. Okay. And did, was no, there a timeline? Was, they were, they were lies to be perfectly honest. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> But um, but those false promises and those false hopes, like you said, I mean, it's really uh, stress. It, it does. It takes time as well. I mean, some people say we're going to travel, but generally in, in a career or in a, in the corporate world, I mean, a minimum. Of, I remember hearing in my case a minimum of five years before you can travel, and I thought five years. That's a that's a that's a long time. That's a that's yes. a. Yeah. Um, so all right. So tell us. So you said all right. That's enough. The thing. I I really need to travel. I. This has got to happen. So what did you do then? 
I knew I wanted to do two things because I think this this desire to do something great and to have these adventures had really boiled up in me. So I knew I wanted to circumnavigate the planet. I always wanted to just go around the globe. I just I felt like that was something I needed to do in my life. I didn't need to do it like on a boat or by foot, but I just wanted to do it and say that I've done it. And I've done it. And two, I wanted to take the Trans-Siberian Railway because I read a book and it just sounded it just planted this this like seed of stories. These people had these amazing stories with and they were so simple. It was like I I stepped off the train and this guy with an AK-47 like demanded I get back on. It was like, whoa, okay. So then I was like, I want something like that, you know? And it's <laughs> AK-47. I, I don't want a guns pointed at my face, but I want an adventure. And I figured that I figured that for the most part they would be safe adventures because people take the Trans-Siberian all the time. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's a commuter train in Russia, really, is what it really boils down to. It's just more adventurous and sounds really sexy because it's called the Trans-Siberian. <laughs> it's true. And Siberia. So you, your perception of Siberia is this, like, frozen wasteland. And fact is, it was summertime and it was boiling hot and everybody was in, like, shorts and tracksuits. But um, <laughs> so I wanted to do this. So, so I, I seized on the opportunity to do it. And I just I told my friends and I told my family I'm going to do this. And they kind of pushed back a little bit, but not a lot. And then once I actually bought the ticket and committed the, committed myself to it, the support came through. And then they really, um, they were either proud or, or maybe a little jealous, but really overall, they were super supportive. And they were like, wow, I can't wait to hear about your travels. I'm, I can't believe you're doing this. And, you know, these are my friends who were in law school or my friends who uh, had started careers in sales. And, and a lot of my friends are very successful. And they're doing it. And, and I think they're happy. I think they're very happy. Um, in their lives, you know, but they're not, they're not building this thing that you and I are building, which is right. a more of a lifestyle business. And so this was really the moment, this trip went to 12 different countries, maybe it was 10, 10 to, 10 to 12 different countries. And it over and over and over again, it redefined my perception of travel, its value and what it means to become an explorer of this world. And, uh, and when I got back, uh, I knew, you know, I, I just knew. And this is why I travel, to find that feeling that you know when you get back. Like, you know, you just can't can't go back to being the same person that you were before you left. And then once you're there and once you do get back and you get home and everybody has, everybody wants the person that you were to return home and be that person for them again. Their definition of you, you know, they start pressing that upon you. And then you start to feel this kind of, you start to push back to that, Right. So then I got home. I mean, I don't mean to glaze over this entire trip. We can get into it if you yeah, want. Yeah, we're going back to it, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> but real quick, like I got home and it was like, this is this is who you are. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? And I had changed in different ways and I knew that I wanted to do this. And my mind had opened uh, all of a sudden because I realized that, you know, I'd spent time in Bali and I'd lived with a people who couldn't afford to fly off of their own island and bathe in the streets and were the happiest most beautiful people I'd ever seen and lived in um, an amazing place. And it redefined my definition of needs and desires. It redefined what and what and what I wanted out of life and how I was going to go and get it. You know, I want to talk about your trip, but I want to focus. There's something I do want to say about uh, a change. I, I too, and I think a lot of us are afraid to, to change. I mean, we, we think traveling is going to change us. And I was scared of that. I thought I, I don't want to come back and, be changed. Uh, I want to be something. I mean, I want to, I want to, I still want to be the person that I was and I, I, you know, it's, it's a fearful thing. So, I mean, knowing that that changed you or no, I I mean, people being afraid of that change, is there a reason to be afraid of that change? I mean, from what you're saying, it's like so many incredible positive changes. I mean, just say something about that change. Just say something about that change. That change is that change is what it's all about, Libby. I mean, if anybody is afraid of that change, uh, don't don't be afraid of that change because that change isn't going to ruin you. It's going to make you better. The, the the fact of the matter is is that is that you need if you want to understand the world in which you live in, you need to go out and see it. You need to go out and experience it, right? And then you can come out, come home, and derive uh, a, a more informed perspective about the place in which you live, and perhaps more importantly, about yourself and the direction you want to go in your life. And if you go out and you travel and you put yourself in these uncomfortable positions, these situations that force you to explore, that force you to, to challenge yourself and step up, rise to the occasion and do things that you didn't think you were capable of doing, whether that's summiting a mountain or eating a weird food, you know, or interacting with a stranger when you previously considered yourself antisocial. It's these little things that we do 
that create the stories that we that we carry you know around with us and take home and share for the rest of our lives that not only change who we are fundamentally but they inform us of what we want to do with our lives and they make a legend out of your life effectively yeah and help us grow um i guess i guess exactly where i was going with that we're scared of it but what you just said is perfect i mean it's it's we we grow we change it helps us define who we are and what we want out of life so i think that's important now you're you're great with um you you talk a lot about stories and you told me a great story about great and the great wall china a couple different ones but but tell us a story that that did help you define or figure out more about who you who you were and and what you wanted out of life Ooh. uh Oh, I can draw. I mean, it has to be a travel story. There's so there's so many as I as I um as I figure this out. Um, you know, travel kind of really just boils down to, for me, I mean, it, it, it ultimately ends in cultivating imagination. But you can cultivate imagination by putting yourself in these uncomfortable positions to have to to let the best stories, not seek the best stories out, but let them happen to you. And you do that by exploring, by giving yourself not don't overplan your travels. Let yourself just go to these places and wander, meet people, wander off the beaten path, go to these little these little things, and the smallest things will leave lasting impressions on you. So, uh, yeah, so it's interesting. Your question was about getting a better sense of what I wanted out of life from my travels, or just All in general. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, you, you've told me some great travel stories. Like, um, you met someone on the great wall of China. Uh, maybe there's some nugget in there that teaches us, um, things that you can learn when you travel that you don't expect. Um, oh, actually. All right. So talk about expecting things or setting expectations for things. Great wall of China is an interesting, an interesting example, because if you go there and you do the hike and there's, there's a hike from, uh, you can either go to Bada Ling, I believe it's what it's called. And that's basically the, the restored tourist parts. I think they have like a little, like, bear enclosure it's totally touristy and then there's Lamanai, which is basically you can do this 10 kilometer hike on a crumbling part of the great wall it's it's like it, the great wall is crumbling beneath your feet it's actually quite awful but it's um, it's an amazing it's an amazing trek and you're just going through the mountains on top of the on top of the wall and you can look at when you get there all right there are people there there are the chinese people the local villagers will come over and they will peddle their wares and they will they will walk up to you and they will start talking to you and they'll talk to you as you go. I had been traveling at this point before I got to the Great Wall. I'd been on the road for six or seven months. And so by the time I got there, I was very open to meeting new people and I was very patient with people and curious about people who were different than me. And so when I had the opportunity to interact with somebody that was Chinese, especially a villager, I, you know, not like a, somebody that lived in an urban setting like Beijing, uh, I, I kind of seized upon it, but somebody had given me the advice ahead of time to say, you know, these people are going to come up to you. Don't let them like ruin your track. Right. So what happened is this guy came up to me and he approached me and he started talking to me and I knew right off the bat that he was just going to try to sell me something. Right. Mm-hmm. But what I did was I just kind of embraced him and we just started talking and he started teaching me Chinese and I started teaching him English. And then we started kind of interacting about our cultures and telling each other about our villages, even though we couldn't speak each other's language. And he would take my picture and I would stop and he had this fan and he would like fan me. And that's an exhausting hike. And it was like 75 degrees. So that was very welcome. And by the time I, I got to the point where he was like, okay, I need to go, but would you like to buy something from me? We had interacted. He's like, listen, this is just, you know, $10 or something. At that point I had no, I knew this was coming. I embraced it. And I was paying him not for the t-shirt that I still have, but for the interaction that we had between each other. And I think that it's really important to recognize that on your travels, don't set an expectation. Don't define the experience that you want to have. Be open to the experience that happens to you because that's where the best stories begin to happen once you let the world happen to you. That's, that's what it's all about, Libby. That's why, that's why we travel. That's exactly why we travel. And I, I am so with you. The, you're paying for the experience and, and not the T-shirt. No, yeah, yeah. Don't travel for the photo. Travel for the stuff that you didn't expect to happen. Take that home. The best stories of your travels aren't, I went to Rome and saw the Colosseum. It's, I went to Rome, I got lost, somebody stole my wallet, and then I, you know, had to go and get my, my uh, driver's license renewed so that I could get home or something like that. And, you know, I, I know that's, a, that's an awful thing to say, that like, you should go out and seek bad experience. Don't do that. It's just that when bad stuff happens to you, recognize that something – Something that you get to share for the rest of your life, you know, is, is occurring. And embrace, embrace that, fight through it, and you're going to come out on the other end with an amazing story. 
Yeah, I don't know. You're so far you're talking about wallets getting stolen in AK-47s, but uh... <laughs> you know what? After a while, I think when you when you get out there and you travel and stuff, uh, these things you, you seek adventure, and these these are like the symbols of adventure almost. And and but they're common. They're common adventure. You don't need to go and um, trek across the empty quarter of a particular desert. You know, it, it's it's not about doing something that's extreme, going to the South Pole, you know, or riding your bike around the world. It's about taking adventures in whatever way you can. Adventure is relative. It, it, it absolutely is. It's, it, you can go and find perfectly awesome, messed up experiences in your backyard if you go and look. You just have to be open-minded. You have to be imaginative. You need to go out and explore your backyard the way you did as a kid. Go find a river that flows near your house and take a canoe ride on that and see where it leads. You know, you're going to start to look at the world in a new way and it's going to renew your creativity and cultivate your imagination. And that's what that's that's my philosophy of travel, Libby. And that's why travel matters, because if we had a population of people, a culture of people in the United States that took a global view with that approach, we'd have a more informed, authoritative uh, society and everybody would be, would be better informed. We'd be more connected. We'd be more in touch with other cultures. We'd be uh uh, in general, we would be more interesting people. I agree with you. There's a lot of great, great wisdom in there. Um, you talk to a lot of people. I'm kind of trying to check just for for a little bit because you talk to a lot of people that have lifestyle businesses that travel. So for people who yeah. are, you know, potentially listening to this, who are saying, "Great, I'm I'm sold. Like I'm ready <laughs> to open my mind. I want to create stories. I want to travel," um, but they're in a job. And the, or maybe they're aspiring entre- entrepreneurs. Like, what what are some of the first steps that people can take? I mean, they, maybe they have the dream inside of them, or they want to create that dream inside of them. As you've, ex- you've explained, you've explained. So, yeah. what uh, what are some of the first steps that people can take? You mentioned. So, go ahead. Yeah. So let me let me let me do this because I I have talked to a lot of people that have effectively and to put it simply made travel a bigger priority or component in their life, and they've done so not by just quitting their job and backpacking and giving everything up, you know, and making no money. They have created lives and careers out of this, this, this desire to see and experience the world, to, to grow from it. Because they recognize that the real world isn't the nine to five job where you go to the office and you, and you, you, you step through this routine every day. And you're, by the end of the day, you're sapped of energy. Why? Not because you work too hard, but because you weren't imaginative enough. The work that you did didn't interest you enough, right? So you, we all get into kind of stuck in this like zombified trance state in which we're like, we're like hamsters on a hamster wheel, right? And we just kind of uh, go through the motions. And so we want more out of life. And I think anybody that's inclined to become an explorer recognizes that there's something out there that's waiting to find them, that's waiting to happen to them. And they want to put themselves in a position to do that. So then the question then becomes, how can we create a lifestyle for ourselves that supports that need, that supports that knowledge about the way the world is and that how can we get out, see the real world, still make our money and still support ourselves, still not sacrifice the desire to have a family or to uh, own property or to do any of the things that we all want to do. And we're at that unique point in time in which it's suddenly become a realistic possibility. And that, I mean, it's, it's a really inspiring time to do that. And the more you kind of think about it, I don't know about you, but the more it kind of catalyzes me to get started and to work deeper into it. Absolutely. And so, so I talked to, yeah, I talked to a lot of people who are doing it, whether they started travel blogs and somehow made that successful. Uh, you, the majority of people who started travel blogs and then have been able to sustain their travels from that got started so early on that they built a large enough audience at the beginning that now there's so many travel blogs it's impossible to, it, not impossible, but it's near impossible to gain enough traction with your website to support your travels. So that's why I've been bringing a lot on my podcast. I've been bringing a lot of digital nomads and location independent entrepreneurs on to figure out how they've created lifestyles for themselves that support this notion of making travel a bigger priority. So you're asking me, what is the like the first step is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, actually, let's even talk a little bit about you've you've done it and you do it through freelancing yeah. and through yep. entrepreneurship. So I think I mean a lot of people do it through freelancing and the dream is through entrepreneurship in a lot of ways. I mean it depends, but yeah. uh, just the idea of of being location dependent. Like, how do you talk, can you talk a little bit about what you've done as a freelancer and then what you're doing as an entrepreneur? 
So Lydia, I've definitely gone through the motions of, of, uh, learning and struggling through all the different, uh, aspects of living and working anywhere and understanding why this is, why this is or is not working. So what I mean is when I got back from my trip and I knew that I didn't want to go back to being the person that I was before, um, I took this, uh, I, I, I had been bartending and cleaning hostels and stuff and I knew I didn't want to go back and start bartending again. So I was like, all right, well, what can I do? What can I do to pack my parachute so that I can always have something to do that will support me? And then how can I become good enough at that thing to be able to get back out there on the road and travel on an ongoing basis whenever I want to, or at least create a, a degree of freedom for myself so that I can travel more than just the two weeks a year that we all get to travel with. Because when you only get to travel for two weeks every year, you have to sacrifice where you go. Uh, you know, I was just in Switzerland in, in a couple months ago just to work. I just went and spent a week there because one, I'd never seen Switzerland. Two, I needed to work and I wanted to think creatively. So I get out of my comfort zone. I had a, a super cheap mis mistake fair there. So I took advantage, went over and just worked. And it was, it was so productive of me to do that. But if I only had two weeks to choose, I wouldn't go and spend a week in Switzerland by myself working. No, I'd be asking my wife, where do you want to go with your two weeks? And we'd be settling on a place that would optimize value and the time in which, and we'd be over planning. We'd be saying, all right, when we get there, we need to do all these things because it's our only chance, right? Now, suddenly I have, I have unlimited time in which I can travel in any given year. And I don't have to make these sacrifices uh, for destination and activity when I travel. So I have a new perspective that allows me to explore more because I'm able to then work and support myself, uh, which, which, you know, frees me up to do what I want to do when I go to these places. So uh, what was the question? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's an amazing benefit of travel. And I haven't heard anybody else put it that way before. And uh, so, yeah, so the question is, so like you, you were doing, you were able to free yourself to go to Switzerland, but what kind of things were you doing? You're freelancing and you created this travel podcast. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is like, how can people find paths to make income away from their oh, jobs? Yes. Okay, so, so I got back from my travels. I didn't want to bartend anymore. I immediately learned web design skills, graphic design and web design okay. skills. I had a background where I knew that I have enough of it. Took, I was filmmaking. I was raised by an artist. I was kind of a visual person. I always drew as a kid. So okay. I, I, graphic design made sense to me. And then web design was, was a way I could kind of do it in a way that I enjoyed because I knew I didn't want to get into print design. That's, that's no fun. So, <laughs> so uh, How did you start, though? I mean, for people who may or may not have this kind of background in web design, like uh, how do you get yourself started? Like how do you so, teach I went to, you know, there's a thousand different ways to start. I went to a, um, like a web design trade school outside of Boston at the time when I got home and I was out of money for my travels and, and I was just kind of like, all right, well, I'm just going to settle down. I'm going to do some work and I'm going to go to school and I'm going to learn this, 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 uh, skill set so that I can continue on or begin to build a lifestyle that I want to build. Uh, but you can do it anyway. You can go to treehouse.com and you can start learning coding skills and you can pick that up, you know, and, uh, or you can go to, uh, I don't know, Udemy and just start picking up like beginner skills to coding or, but it also, it doesn't have to be coding. It can be anything. So I guess the point I'm trying to make here, Libby, and I'll cut to the chase is, is that anybody that wants to go and create the lifestyle that I'm kind of espousing and that I've been very philosophical with, and I'm sorry about that, but I can't, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it really matters. Uh, Anybody that wants this lifestyle, it's out there for you to take it. You just have to recognize that you, you, you need to learn the skills to do it, and you need to be happy with, with the way in which you provide a service with those skills. All right? So it's really simple. So um, it doesn't have to be web design. It doesn't have to be development or anything computer-oriented. It just has to be something that you can do from a laptop anywhere in the world. And it, it can be writing. It can be editing. It can be illustration. It can be photography. You know, all of these things are skills. And it's, I mean, if, if you want to live a life of travel, identify or develop the skill, right? Like for yourself. And then find the applicable purpose for that skill that resonates with you. A way in which you want to help someone else, right? Like by providing that skill in the form of a service. If, if, and this is, this is to say, like, if you want, if you, if you're a good writer, and you want to help people with their copywriting or to write guest posts or keyword research or, you know, any number of, of uh, valuable ap applications of writing. If you hate writing, don't do that. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> right. <laughs> if you've not, if you're not satisfied with with guest posting, then find a different way to, to apply your skill as a writer or an editor. You know, maybe you like editing better than writing, or maybe right. you'd rather somebody sends you their articles that they wrote and you just clean up their writing to make them sound awesome. Maybe that's your calling. The fact of the matter is, it's even better if you can help leverage an already successful business to become more successful. Okay. So that now we're getting now I'm kind of I kind of feel like I just jumped ahead, but you did jump around a little bit. I mean, so, so just what you're saying is take your skill, define yeah. it a little bit more, figure out what it is that resonates with you. It's not just writing; it's so broad. It's not just web design, but what aspect of that can you really excel at? Because yeah. you're going to be doing this. This is your life. This is your purpose, and connecting with that. I mean, that's a whole other topic, but connecting with that so that you're not feeling like you're slaving away or working; that you're actually giving and and able to 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 be to living your purpose really i think is what where we're going with that it's living your purpose rather than pursuing your passion uh, and i don't want to like push off the idea of passion it's, there's passion become this kind of strange buzzword but it's it's important to, to know what you're passionate about and to pursue those things because they make you happy or they help you uh become happier with other people but i think it's more about identifying the thing that you want to uh that you, that you derive some sort of fulfillment in, in, in doing. And so your passion might be something that you can't monetize. You might, your passion might be new cultures, new, new experiences, travel. It might be meeting people, might be mountaineering or something, you know, but you don't necessarily need to make a business out of that passion. You might just make a business that supports your passion. Just find a purpose for your business and that will satisfy you enough on an emotional level to be able to support your lifestyle and your lifestyle should be able to be your passion. Um, and if you're lucky enough that your passion is something that you can make money off of, that's great. But I just think that there's a, there's this big movement to like find your passion and live your passion and right. your passion needs to be your work. And it doesn't like that's to me, that's almost dangerous advice because it makes people feel, who, who don't have a passion feel like they're, they're confined. They're not one of the lucky ones and you don't need to be, you don't need the passion to tie and correlate with the money that you make. It doesn't have to be that way. So then you just said a second ago that, I mean, so there's, there's the freelancing option, there's the entrepreneurial path, and there's also teaming up with somebody else and using your skill, your purposeful skill, or the, the, something that you connect with to make their business better. And that's, that's an option as well. So the freelance path is trading your time for money. Right. It's having, having a skill that you provide as a service. So I'm going to put 20 hours of my own time into building a website. You're going to give me, you know, $5,000. Okay. The entrepreneurial way of looking at that is more visionary. It's more like I can edit audio. So I'm going to create a podcast editing service. So then I'm going to find 10 entrepreneurs who will pay me a thousand dollars a month to create a podcast editing service, which I will then outsource to editors in the Philippines to follow my blueprint that I wrote out and boom, there's your $10,000 a month business. And I'll tell you what, podcasting is booming. So if that's something that you can relate with, Take that idea and run with it because you can, you can do it. And it will support your travels. You can go anywhere. You can do that off a laptop, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, then, uh, and then the third is partnering with somebody, which is a little bit more complicated. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's, it's if you can help, like Libby, like if we were to work together, if, if, if I were to start, you know, becoming a marketing channel with my podcast to live and work anywhere, then there would be a way for us to, to establish a partnership and create revenue streams that we could then uh, find a way to share and balance in, a, in an agreed upon fashion, right? Right. I love the way, I, this this great uh, description for, I mean, we could dig, in, dig into that a little bit more, but I think you just laid it out perfectly, like what people can do to create a business to live and work anywhere. I mean, uh, rewind and play that back because it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, it's it, the, thing, the point is, is that it's out there and you don't need, yeah. like audio editing, you don't even need the audio editing skills. Just find audio editors right. in the Philippines or um, uh, Brazil. I have an editor in Brazil and and find somebody that, will edit for less than you would need to charge in order to sustain your lifestyle and consider that the cost and then charge, you know, like 10 X that, and then create the value, create 10 times the value in your, in your, you know, in your design, right. pitch that off to the editor, have them do exactly what you're telling and then execute that. That's your, that's, that's, it's a simple idea, but you can do that with writing. You can do that with editing. You can do that with videography, film work, uh, film editing, photography, anything that's digital. Is that a bird in the background? It yeah, says, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of sitting in a um, like a porch area. 
Sounds amazing. You're, um, can I say where you are? Yeah, go ahead. You're Cape Cod, right? Yeah, I'm living on Cape Cod for the summer. See, that's living amazing. Work. Thank you. I just had a baby, and it's a very exciting time for me. And talk about adventure. Uh, every day is a new thing. And uh, that's, I think, why people get excited about kids. I never understood it until my friends explained it to me, and now I'm kind of witnessing it. And, th and that's that every day there's something new. And for anybody that's addicted to new experiences but terrified of having children because they're sacrificing this like ability to go out and see the world – Every day is a new thing with kids. And then the other fascinating thing is that I, on my podcast, talk to a lot of people who travel with kids. And I don't know, Libby, if you've ever heard the kind of the thing about going to Disney World with kids and that yeah. it's, it's fun to go to Disney World. But if you go with kids, it's like a blast because they they look at everything like, oh, my God, Mickey Mouse. Right. Going and traveling with little kids to other places is the exact same way. It's just more nuanced and more complex. So that instead of them being like, oh, my God, it's a cartoon character, they say, whoa, what is that? And then you're like, whoa, look at his reaction to that. And then you become aware of all of the foreignness. And you, it's almost like you're hyper, you're hyper sensitive to the, the foreign world that's around you. So for anyone that's like scared of having kids because they feel like they can't travel, it's, it's just different. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. That, uh, I think that limits a lot of people. We think these perceived obstacles are I have kids or I can't or I can't, you know, I can't do this, I can't do that. And you're making me want to just take everybody else's kids and go travel. <laughs> uh, so I take it your baby's going to be traveling quite a bit. I'll tell you what, Libby. I, when I was in Bali, I was on a motorbike and I was driving down this road and there were these kids on the side of the road and they lit this fire. And I turned and I looked at the fire, right? And there's these little kids. And I'm like, oh, that's – what are they cooking? And I didn't know. I was just looking at the fire. And then I turned back, and there's like a brick wall in front of me, like 20 feet, right? So I'm like, oh, my God. So I hit the brakes, and my bike's not slowing down. So then I'm turning, and I'm not going to turn fast enough, so I have to hit the front wheel brake, which sends me careening over the handlebars. Oh, no. And I remember I, – I could hear as I went down, like I could hear the motorbike, like, which I rented, like smashing around behind me. Oh. I hit the, uh, the pavement road. And belly flops and my face, thank God I was wearing a face mask on my helmet because my face went like that against the sidewalk or the, the cement. And I remember just lying there and I was, my knees are torn up, my arms are torn up, everything's messed up, my body is like road rash. And all these villagers come over to me and they're all like, they're all like, come with me, oh my God, are you okay? Come with me, come with me, are you okay? And I kind of like get up and I'm like, what just happened? And I'm like in complete shock. And then this little English boy comes over like through the crowd. And he's like, come with me. And I was like, I'm going to go with you. And so I follow him around the brick wall to a resort where he is, his mother, I guess, is this uh, English expat who owns this resort. And he's this like young eight-year-old kid or something, right? And he... So his mother kind of brings me bandages and some stuff and has to clean, her own, clean my own wounds, which I completely respect. And... Um, I'm just thankful that, you know, she's there to take care of me or she's there to kind of give me somewhere to like decompress. Yeah. And this whole time, this kid's next to me and he's like, he's, he's just talking and he's telling me jokes or he's asking me questions that, that distract me or he's showing me yo-yo tricks. And he's clearly very obviously trying to distract me from the fact oh. that like I had just totally messed myself up <laughs> and that I was in this like complete shock and very scared in a very strange place. And my takeaway from this is that this kid clearly was used to strange new people coming and going in his life. And he had an understanding of Balinese life, and English life, and maybe more. And, you know, he was like, he, he, was, he was dressed really cool and like long hair and like bracelets. And I was like, who is this kid? He's like an eight-year-old kid and he's cooler than anybody I've ever met. The point is, is I took away and I was like, that's the kid, man. Like that's the, the, these interesting, engaged, multicultural people. That, that occur, that happen when they're raised in environments that they have to adapt in these different environments that they have to adapt to and relate to and then become accustomed to. It's almost like these people, are they grow up in, in the unknown and they become comfortable with uncertainty. And if you want to be entrepreneurial and you want to start your own business, getting out there and traveling and experiencing the unknown and getting comfortable with uncertainty, that's where greatness is, is created, Libby, because you can come back and you'll be so much less afraid to take risks take challenges, to go out and try things, to fail, to, 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 to have these, again, if your wall gets stolen in Rome, it's not the end of the world. It's just another day. It's a great story and one you can learn from. Yeah. And even you scrape yourself up from head to toe, you can, you know, you're over it, but it really is. It's about overcoming obstacles and travel is great to help overcome obstacles and know how to, how to find sort of some 
how to find inner strength. That's a great story. I got, I got chills thinking, just thinking about that. Cause he's, um, it's a great example. I mean, there's expats all over the world and they're raising kids and they're doing it all the time and there's schools and there's communities. And so I think that's fantastic in terms of, um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but in, in terms of living away from anywhere, I did want to ask you, what's your, what are the criteria? What do you need when you travel, when you pick a travel destination, you pick Switzerland, um, what kind of things did you look for? Works like in terms of working or communicating? Like what's yeah. most important to you? So I think finding a work environment that's cohesive is an ongoing issue for anybody that wants to go and live and work anywhere. Um, which is why travel is to me, like that's why I love traveling to work because I, I, I can care less about where I'm working and because everywhere is, is, is new, you know, whereas when I'm at home and I don't, I, and I need to get out of the, the, like the home apartment or whatever. I need to get out of my, my, my home. I have to go to a coffee shop, but if I'm in, at home, I have to go to one of like six different coffee shops just to keep this like frenetic environment alive. And if I keep going to the same place and that becomes a new routine, right? Mm -hmm. So when I go to Switzerland, just to be creative, it's okay because I've never been there. So I can kind of go anywhere. So I can work in hotel lobbies or I can work in cafes or I can work in co-working spaces, you know? And to me, it's just about going to traveling to new places in order to be free. Now, what do I need in order to get my work done? I need a good internet connection. And if they can make a great cappuccino, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it really just boils down to having the internet. And, and power is good, but you know, that's why I got the MacBook Air because I've got like a 12 hour battery. Does it so, really last 12 hours? Because for me, I can't seem to make it last that long. But you have to, one, make sure Dropbox is not running in the background. Two, dim your screen. And three, don't go running, uh, don't run your Wi Fi when you need to, and don't play video. Don't record Skype calls. Don't record Skype calls. <laughs> I know I'm down to 66% from 100. So this is right. <laughs> That's how that happens. Um, so, so internet's important and looking for a place. And what kind of places do you um, – I had a question. I lost it. What kind of places do you, do you look for or what's, what's – um, you mentioned product. Actually, I wanted to ask you about productivity and, and creativity. So you talked about creativity, and I also wanted to ask you about your routine. So it sounds like you like to bounce around. Um, so what is your, what does your daily routine look like? When Do you keep it the same when you're traveling? Good question. Um, no, when I travel, I'm more inclined to, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I think this is what happens when you build travel in your life on, on an unrestricted basis, when you have more than just two weeks and you have kind of unlimited time. I'm more inclined to do work when I travel because I really enjoy the work that I do. So when I go to these new places, I'm actually really, I'm really entertained by the idea of sitting in a, like a cafe and, and letting the world kind of unfold around me. To me, that's an authentic experience. And if I'm sitting there working on client work, that is more, that's the, I'm getting my, my new experience. I'm fulfilling my addiction to the new, to new just by being there. And then I can kind of more peacefully, calmly work on things. So, so it's kind of, a, it's kind of a funny thing, but I am, I'm more inclined to put more time into my, into my work and then just structure my days around meals. Whereas at home, I get home, I wake up, I have, I immediately uh, have coffee, the best coffee I can get. And then the mornings usually spent doing errands, usually spent, you know, um, taking care of the things that I need to get done. And then, uh, the afternoon is when I start to settle into my work and I kind of slowly do that. And then I take a good break for, for dinner and then, and then I work into the night and I'm most productive at night. Um, and I, and I think that that's probably true because I think if we want to talk about creativity, you're more inclined. All right. Creativity is all about snuffing out that little voice inside your head that says no, or that has fear or restricts you in any way. If you want to optimize your creativity, you need to, you need to stop listening to that voice. And the best way to stop listening to that voice and do crazy things is to do them when you're desperate for sleep, which is why, you know, I, I think it's why um, I'm most productive at night because all of a sudden I'm like, the day has maybe backed up on me a little bit, but I'm okay because I can, I can power through it and I can do it in, in a more creative fashion with less, self public uh, self self editing almost self revising as i go interesting i'm going to throw i'm throwing a couple of random questions your way but i did want to ask you about budgeting uh when you're traveling so you're more productive more productive or at least you work more when you travel which i think is so fascinating it's not the first time i've heard that um and you are more do you spend more or less or how do you budget when you travel and i think a lot of people think traveling is crazy expensive and i'm just i'm trying to get an idea for 
how much people should budget and what you do? Really complicated question. Um, so it depends on what you want to do, where you want to go, or how long you want to travel for, the style of travel and what you're going to go for, right? So um, let's talk about me personally. Uh, I like to go to places that I find an opportunity to go for uh, as close to free as possible. It's basically that's basically what dictates my travels. Okay, so I went to Switzerland because I had because I found a mistake fare through a Norwegian partner of United Airlines that was selling the fare for $125 round trip. Okay, so I flew to Milan and back for $125. Why? Because this airline was accidentally selling the fare for like a three hour window, and I happened to follow the right Twitter accounts to know that this is happening. Right. Um, but, you know, it might come down to where I can get good redemptions on points and miles because I'm big into the whole points and miles game or travel hacking or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, we can talk about that, you know, at a different time. But Yeah, well, to give it, you can give us a, a tip or two as, as we're talking here. I definitely want to bring you back on to talk about all of the uh... – some of the some of the track some of the hacks that you have, but this is great. I mean, near free or um, I think a lot of people do think travel is crazy expensive. So hearing how you're hacking through it is is great. So tell us. Yeah, I mean, there's other ways to do it. You can Airbnb yourself around the world if you want and stay in these authentic places. I like to usually put the majority of my money into my accommodation, and the reason for that is because you can, and especially in foreign countries, the reason for that is because you can stay more authentically in people's homes. Uh, than in a uh, sterilized hotel room. The hotel is, is, is valuable to the person who enjoys a comfort zone, who needs to be able to retreat from the places in which they are. Because Libby, you know what every hotel room looks like. You already know what the next hotel room you're going to stay in looks like, right? It, they all look the same. They're all laid out the same way. You walk down the hallway, there's a bathroom, and then there's the bed, and then there's the table next to the bed, and there's the cabinet with the TV in it and the mini fridge underneath it. There's a terrible painting on the wall, and there may or may not be a desk and a chair in the room. And that's it. That's like, that's the hotel room. And I understand the value of that as a comfort zone. But if you really want to, what, what hotels do is they isolate you from the environment in which you're traveling to. So I like to put my money into accommodations and finding authentic accommodations that cost less than hotels and don't provide me the escape from the place that I'm investing my, my hard-earned money into experiencing. You know, I'd rather live like a local for the week that I'm in a different place than see the sights and live like, you know, uh, the Crown Plaza tells me to live. And, and how do you, that's great. How, and how do you do that? Like, what, where do you find these places? Are you, do you go to Airbnb? Yeah, Airbnb, there's a couple of things. There's Airbnb, there's go with, oh, you can rent apartments uh, on Craigslist. You can house sit, you can home swap. There's, there's, it depends on the duration of time in which you want to go. If you're going to go for... You know, let's say you're going to go to a foreign country for like two months. The most cost-effective way of doing that might be to house sit and do a short-term car, car lease, okay? Because then you can get a car for a month paying less than a rental, and you can house sit and stay somewhere for free. And all of a sudden, you've got an authentic place to live and a cheap you know, car rental to go and explore the whole, you know, the whole neighborhood or the whole country if you want to. And, uh, and to me, it's just having, having knowledge of, of all of these different sources. Airbnb is a great, it's a great resource. Awesome. So can couch you... surfing is another one. Which one? Couch surfing. Or oh, I haven't surfing. even said hostels, Libby. I mean, I'm, a lot of people think oh, hostels are just for backpackers. I'm 31. I just stayed in a hostel a couple months ago. And it was, I, I kid you not, not the fanciest, but the best place I've stayed in years. And the reason for that is because hostels are filled with people who are just like you and that want to meet you as badly as you want to meet them. You know, they're out there. They're exploring the world. They want to have these cultural experiences. And there are these amazing international environments where everybody's kind of their minds are, are opened up and they're open to new experiences and they're open to exploring other people and they want to meet you. So you can have amazing, you can find friends, lifelong friends in like one or two days. And it happens like that. It's unbelievable. And that, that was another question I wanted to ask you about community. You know, people think if I'm traveling solo that, you know, I'm terrified to travel by myself. Like what, how can I find community when I get to the place I'm going? Do you look ahead yeah. of time? Do you go when you get there? You know, it depends. I, I, I mean, it all depends, obviously. But I guess like hostels are a great way to do it. Even if you're not going to stay at the hostel, let's say you're let's say you're afraid of hostels and you need to stay in a hotel for whatever reason. There's a lot of people like that. I respect that. Maybe if you want to go and get some work done, go to a hostel that has Wi-Fi. Hang out there. Reach out and see. pay attention to the people interacting. Talk to the staff who are locals and then start talking to 
maybe, you know, the Korean person that sits down next to you and just ask them questions and just start interacting and start breaking that ice because hostels are filled with amazing community. And then co-working spaces are another place uh, to get amazing entrepreneurial community. If you want to meet partners or you want to embed yourself or, or get input, there's uh, go to, go to Southeast Asia, Saigon, Chiang Mai, Ubud and Bali. These places have, unbelievable networks of entrepreneurs who work in co-working spaces and all of these people, I have these people on my podcast. That's how I know this. I'm interviewing all of them. They are so accessible and so willing to help. That's no matter good. what. Yeah. Can you, can you leave us? Um, I know we got to wrap up just a, quickly here. Um, tell us a little bit. I want to uh, have you tell us a little bit about daily Tra- travel podcast. You mentioned oh, yeah. you interviewing so many different people. Tell us a little bit about it. So uh, about a year ago, I had this idea for a show, and it would basically be a show that talked about, you know, how to travel the world for less money and, and through travel hacking, through all these strategies that we talked about. I kind of found that there weren't that many travel podcasts out there. And by there weren't that many, while there are, are like 100,000, 200, 500,000 travel blogs, there were like five travel podcasts. And most of them uh, a few of them were really old and a couple of them had just started, but they were weekly shows and nobody to my knowledge in the world was doing a daily travel show. So I kind of wanted to seize that opportunity and attempt to own that pocket of the internet because I recognized that I can talk about travel endlessly. I love this. I mean, obviously that's not obvious from this interview. I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what I had to do, but I can talk about travel with anybody. And I think that there's a big demand there's, the opportunity is suddenly there to build travel into your life more often and to go further. And there are ways to look at travel uh, in a way that is not just for me, but it's for something bigger. And I, you know, I, Libby, I really want with this show to elevate the discourse around travel, the value of travel, the benefit to the individual and society. And I really want to kind of um, heighten the perception of why travel matters, why it's important to not to stop to outright stop discouraging our family members from going and travel and instead build the encouragement of travel into our culture. And so if I could just be one tiny little voice helping to nudge, you know, society in that direction, then I think that's a fight worth fighting. So that's, that's what I'm up to. And then if I can help people to make that conscious decision to go out and become explorers of an amazing world, change their lives and come home and make a legend out of their lives and have these amazing stories that they can tell to their friends and family and kids and grandchildren for the rest of their lives, then to me, that makes us all a more interesting, more informed, more authoritative people. And um, more peaceful. Uh, you travel, travel changes you. and More peaceful for like yourself. It kind of puts you at peace. But also less... Uh, I'm going to release a, a piece on my podcast pretty soon on travel's relationship to the decline of violence in society. And this is like people aren't making these connections, but I want to start making these connections because this is why travel really does matter. And, uh, and we have problems in the United States. We're not a very well-traveled people. What if we suddenly became well-traveled people? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that help? Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's a, that's a very valid, uh, valid and uh, honorable mission. So how can we find, how can we learn more about you and how can we find your show? All right, so you can go to dailytravelpodcast.com or you can just search iTunes for Daily Travel or Daily Travel Podcast. Uh, or you can just find me on Twitter at Daily Travel Show. Or you can just find me personally on Twitter at Nathaniel. Um, you can also friend me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Nathaniel. So can I've you spell got, Nathaniel? Yeah, N-A-T-H-A-N-I-E-L. E-L, right, okay. Perfect. So uh, yeah, reach out to me. I, I absolutely, the best part about podcasting, Libby, and you're going to find this about interviewing, is meeting the people that you meet and getting to just connect with them. It's one of the best feelings and my network has exploded and I'm not, I'm almost less interested in growing my network than I am in just connecting with people who are like-minded that have this desire, this appreciation for travel and they're doing it and they're interesting. And uh, it's just really cool. It's really, really cool. Yeah. When you hang out, when you start to, I appreciate you get letting people connect with you. Cause I think that, um, people who need to take that path, want to take the path, uh, your network is important and hanging or who you hang around with, who you associate with, who you talk to is, uh, is key to helping you along your path. So thanks for, thanks for doing that. And I, I hope everybody does listen to your show, the number one show, because, um, you're fascinating to talk to. I, to hear, yeah. I love hearing your stories. I could hear them all day long. So I'll definitely keep listening. So thank you so much for your time, Nathaniel. Everybody check out daily pod travel podcast 
podcast.com. And uh, thanks again. Thanks, Libby. Yeah, reach out to me if you want. I, I probably know somebody that can help you. So just reach out and, and we can get, you know, help create your life of travel. Awesome. Thank you. See ya.